Welcome to WordPath, the show about Oklahoma Indian languages and the people who are teaching and preserving them. Tonight's show is kind of an unusual one. Um, the bulk of the show will be a preview to a future program to be called Family Meals and Fry Bread. Um, Family Meals and Fry Bread is a story that, was, that will be told by Bobby Blossom, the Cherokee speaker. And he's going to be sort of um, doing this a la Justin Wilson, if any of you have watched that Cajun cooking show on public television. Um, He's going to be telling about uh, growing up. He's from um, outside of Locust Grove, Oklahoma, and he grew up with three brothers and four sisters. And um, the sister that was closest in age to him used to do most of the cooking, and then when she went off to Sequoia School, um, he had to learn to cook and sort of take over that role, um, which he wasn't that thrilled with at first. But I've seen him demonstrate his fry bread making before. He makes excellent fry bread, and I think he really enjoys making it and explaining about it. So in the story he talks about growing up and learning to cook and at the same time he's going to be, dem we're going to be doing this on location in a kitchen here in Norman and he's going to be demonstrating his own fry bread recipe and how he does it. And so that will be I think a very full show telling that story and doing that whole uh, recipe demonstration. So we're going to preview the show a little bit now by way of giving you this background on the program so that when it comes later you'll know a little bit about it. And also to talk a little bit about um, some of the words and expressions that come up in the story. Uh, he's not going to be doing this, as I understand, completely um, ad lib. This is a story he's told before. It's been written down. In fact, he first told it for Laura Anderson um, to record and to use as a demonstration for their students at OU in their Cherokee classes. And then some of the students uh, translated the story, transliterated it, and also uh, I guess the word is transliterated when you put it also into the Cherokee syllabary. So it's been written down in all of these ways. Now he may not tell it exactly word for word, but this is a well-known story that Bobby has told many times. And he's cooked a lot of fry bread too. So um, I think we know that it's, it's long enough that it will really fill up the program so any additional discussion should come in a separate program, which is now. And we do, since we do have this written transcript, which uh, Linda Jordan has, and she also has a tape of a, a previous telling of the story, She's been looking at it and uh, looking at some of the more interesting aspects in this story, as Bobby's told it in the past, and pointed out a number of things to me that she thinks would be worth commenting on, not only as relates to the story in particular, but it kind of illustrates something about why Linda and I do the kind of analytical work that we do. In other words, why it's so much fun to be a ling linguist or to do linguistic work, because you get to sort of look into native natural speech and kind of take it apart and see how it's put together and find all the very interesting ways that it's like English and different from English and how different things sort of are associated with each, uh, with each other, say, in the Cherokee language than they are in English. Um, that probably sounds a little abstract the way I just put it, but I think when we start going through some examples you'll understand. So Linda collected together some interesting examples from this story that she um, got a charge out of. <laughs> that were really interesting examples of how the Cherokee language works. And she's told me that Bobby Blossom doesn't find them to be that interesting because, of course, it's his native language. He didn't learn English until he was about seven years old, I think. So it's completely natural to him, and a lot of the, the beauty and structure of the Cherokee language, although he knows it on a subconscious level, it's sort of invisible to him on a conscious level. So sometimes he's surprised when people like Linda or I um, giggle with delight and get all excited about some interesting Cherokee structure that comes out of his mouth. But we're, we're going to go through a few of these examples. There are other interesting things in the story. Uh, there are several loan words that are mentioned in the story, which you can listen for on the program uh, the next time. And we'll, we'll cite some examples here. Um, and then there are a number of uh, foods or cooking utensils that, that sort of don't have a ready-made word in Cherokee. That is, they're not, they're not a simple word as they are in English, so there's a more of a kind of a descriptive phrase to indicate what we're talking about. And some of these are very, very interesting. And, and uh, I think this is one of the interesting things about being a linguist or even a second language learner. When you learn another language and learn the kind of structures and the way things are thought of in that language, it sort of gives you a different uh, window on the world. It makes you look at things a little bit differently than you had before, perhaps. And I think it's pretty fascinating. Now, let me see, have I gone through all of my uh, material I wanted to say to introduce this? I believe so. We're going to have a nice uh, chef's cap, hopefully, that we'll have ready <laughs> for Bobby to wear next time. I think this will be a lot of fun. Um, now, I should say right at, this, uh, at the outset, though, that 
I don't speak Cherokee. I've had a few lessons, and it was a long time ago, and I'm, I'm not good at the Cherokee language at all. So I'm going to try to read some of these examples and um, point to the examples on the chart and so forth. But uh, Linda Jordan's standing by off camera with a microphone, so when I make a mistake, she's going to jump in, right, Linda? <laughs> and, um, or I may call on her if, if I don't quite have the courage to try some of these longer phrases to just pronounce them for you. First of all, um, we said that the story would be called Family Meals and Fry Bread. Linda, could you do us a favor and just pronounce the title in Cherokee for us? Sidanela Janestaya Husko Ale Asantana Gadu. You said a mouthful. <laughs> it's so beautiful. <laughs> that sounds really nice. Um, okay, now let's look at the first kind of group of of uh, examples that we have, there are a number of interesting words and phrasings that um, we have a few examples of them here that I'd like to look at. Um, now he, these are just uh, phrases picked out um, that struck Linda as interesting and I think they are interesting. The first one here uh, is a word that means, or a phrase that means dessert. Linda, I'm going to try this one. Something like, naon agiste jigi. And apparently it breaks down like this. The first part means the, and this means last. And this word here, agiste, means, uh, she's written it out, it to eat, meaning that these three elements of meaning are all contained in this one word. So something about eating it, uh, the, the object being the it. And then the last word means it is. So the last it to eat, it is, means dessert. You can see some, some loose relationship there, although when we translate it very literally, word for word, uh, it sounds sort of awkward, and that's because Cherokee is not English. <laughs> um, English has a simple one-word way of talking about dessert, uh, which actually could be analyzed if we go back to the French word that this was borrowed from. But in English, it's just a word, and we don't think too much about how we're putting meanings together. It's just a very simple, unitary thing. In Cherokee, it, it, if you look at how it breaks down, it's far more complex, but it still just means dessert. So that's one kind of interesting example that you see all the time. And I'm told by Linda, who knows a lot more Cherokee than I do, that Cherokee is especially rich in this kind of what's called morphological structure. Um, I try not to use too much technical linguistic jargon on this program, but we are going to be talking a lot tonight about morphology as opposed to what you might think of as grammar. So let me just take a moment and explain what that is. Um, linguistics looks at the structure of language in general, all the way from the level of how you pronounce a particular consonant or vowel, all the way up to how uh, a whole discourse or speech or story or song might be structured out of sentences. And, and there are many, many levels of organization in between. And morphology is the term that refers to the level of organization um, how shall I describe it? It's how words are made up out of minimal units of meaning. So we have this word here, agisdi, and it has three units of meaning, or maybe two, to eat. The, the two in to eat really doesn't mean much, but it has, we, we, it sort of corresponds to three English words, but we can think of it as having, I guess, two units of meaning or morphemes within the one word. One is the it, which is the object of what's being eaten, and the other is the verb stem itself, to eat. So. This is one word, but it's made up of two morphemes. And morphology is the study of that level of organization of language. That is, how are words put together out of smaller pieces? And uh, what, uh, what are the rules by which you put together certain morphemes with other morphemes? What happens when you do? It's that sort of level of organization. So when you do a very literal translation of a language like Cherokee, you can't just have one word on the Cherokee line and put the one English word below it. That won't be adequate to really show what's going on in the language because many words like this one have two or more units within them. And, and as I said, I understand that Cherokee is sort of famous or infamous for doing this. A lot of Native American languages are like that in that, um, unlike English, which is, in the general scheme of things, is sort of a word-by-word -word language, we have complex words made up of prefixes and suffixes and so forth. But <clears throat> we have a higher percentage than some languages do of, of single morpheme words, just a single word that can't be broken down further and that means something. A word like dessert, for instance, it's just got one morpheme in it. Dessert means dessert, you can't break it down into its two or three parts. 
whereas Native American languages tend to be more polymorphemic, that is, have more morphemes per word, perhaps on average, than English does. So one thing that happens when you're an English speaker learning an Indian language is that your first impression is, oh, these languages are so much more complex than English. Um, I can tell you that generally a statement like that is going to be a little misleading because linguists like to say that all languages are roughly equally complex. That is, they can all talk about anything. They just have different ways of organizing the bits of information. So maybe one language has more complex morphology, but it has a simpler syntax, or that which is the level of organization uh, on the level of the sentence, how you put the words together within a sentence uh, or within a phrase. Anyway, so what, a lot of what we're talking about tonight is morphology, and Cherokee has a lot of it, lots of prefixes and suffixes, and I don't know what all else. So let's go on and look at a couple more examples. Uh, this is one that uh, Linda cited. Uh, this word means orange, uh, the lohonige. I'm sorry, any Cherokee native speakers that are cringing, I'm doing the best I can, and Linda has promised to jump in if I really butcher anything. <clears throat> anyway, she thought this was interesting because, and actually this is coincidentally very much like English, the same word mean, refers to the fruit, which we call orange, or to the color orange. Um, you'll find that in a lot of languages that there will be some kind of distinction because one is an adjective and one is a noun, or because of the, the ways it can be used. Uh, or there may even be some completely different word for orange, like um, in some languages you kind of take the word for yellow and red and put them together because there isn't a, a primary color word for orange. You have yellow and you have red, but there's no special word for orange, so you just sort of say yellowish red and maybe the fruit has some entirely different name. It happens that both are called with the same word in Cherokee. Um, next example is just one of those strange coincidences. It's the kind of thing that makes, when you learn a language that has an association like this that you're not used to making, it kind of makes you go, huh. And you, and you never see these two things the same way again. The two things we're talking about here are an iron pot and crabgrass. And, and, uh, I guess this comes up in the food story because there's an iron pot involved. I don't think he has crabgrass in his fry bread. <laughs> but anyway, um, this word would be julaski or something like that. And it, when you come across something like this, it's just interesting. I think it's fascinating and it's one of the really fun aspects of language learning is that you, you think, whoa, maybe I heard this wrong. Could this be a mistake, an iron, an iron pot and, and grass having the same word? Of course, there, there is always the possibility of homonyms in language. I mean. Why is the pan past tense of blow in English, why does it sound exactly like the color blue? I think that's just a sheer coincidence. But I think this one is not a sheer coincidence. That the, I think the Cherokee speaker really is seeing an association between these two things that maybe the English speaker doesn't see. And I'm guessing, and Linda, Linda suggested this theory too, that it has something to do with the, crab, the roots of the crabgrass and the fact that they're so strong, uh, which we all, all of us who have done any gardening know <laughs> or any lawn care. Um, they have iron-like uh, roots that reach out and are very hard to break or cut and, and tear out of the ground easily. And of course an iron pot being iron is very hard to, doesn't break off easily and so forth. So I think there, there's a, a non-accidental association here, but still it's an association that the English language doesn't make. So it kind of makes you go, huh, what do you know? <laughs> One of the interesting things about Cherokee, let's go on to another page. I'll have to get up for a second. Now, this next set of examples um, is again um, a group of, of meanings that are associated in Cherokee in a way that they are not in English. And the basis, the unifying theme here is, is dryness. So there's a word for dry Ukayoda, sort of. Um, now there are these related words and phrases here that descri describe different things that have dryness as some component of their meaning, but when you see this chart of all these things with this same element in, in each phrase, it kind of makes you think, hmm, isn't that interesting that that's the way the language sees these things as being related. Now, uh, the word for pepper, this is like black pepper, right, Linda? That you would use at the table is dikayodi. And you can see, uh, I don't know exactly what the pre different prefixes and so forth are here, but you can see that a lot of this word is, is almost the same. And Linda says they are very related. And so I think when a Cherokee speaker 
talks about pepper, somewhere in the back of their mind is this notion of dryness, which is not in the back of the mind of a monolingual English speaker that knows only English. Um, we wouldn't really have any association like that at all. I think we think pepper, if you did one of those psychological tests, first word that comes into your mind or something, you would say salt, you know, the opposite of pepper. Or something. We don't have any, we don't think of dryness at all. And here's a phrase that means dried eggs. Let's see if I can try, if I can have the courage to try this one. Dikayodi, dikotlana, jueji. And so the first element here means dry, dikayodi. Just, it sounds just like pepper, and you can see that it has some similarity and relatedness to the word for dry. The second word means they're made. Dikotlana. And the last word, jueji, means eggs. So if you took this literal morpheme by morpheme, morpheme uh, translation of the Cherokee, it sounds very awkward in English, dried, they're made eggs. But I think it's, um, it's eggs that have been made dried, and so it's all very logical, and, and it certainly explains what the dried eggs are. It does so in a more complex way, maybe, than the simple English phrase, dried eggs. But I think the meaning is, is very equivalent. It just seems more complex when we see it in Cherokee. And then the final example here having to do with dried is this expression for bacon. Sik how oh, let me start over again. Sik di And so this is the first part means pig, sik um hawiya, meat, dikayodi, dried. There's the word for dried again, just like up here. So so bacon is being described as dried pig meat, which certainly is is part of what it is. I tell you, I'm from Virginia where they have Smithfield hams and it's very special uh kinds of bacon that I'm very proud of, <laughs> of growing up with. And so the, my first association actually with bacon is salted pig meat because it's very, very salty stuff the way they make it in Virginia. I don't know what the local uh, bacon is that this phrase you know, makes reference to, whether it tastes different or whether, whether the language is just simply expressing it a little bit differently. Certainly bacon, there is some drying, I think, in it. Just about anything you'd call bacon, that's one of the elements of it. So, let's look at some more examples now. Here's another group of words and expressions <coughs> that kind of group around another theme, and here the theme is mixed up. The word in Cherokee for mixed up is, uh, let me see now. Make sure I get this right. Asuyanaha, more or less. And that, that word all by itself also means salad. Um, so when you say salad in Cherokee, you're saying mixed up. It is mixed up stuff. Um, in English, we just say salad, and it doesn't really have an association with any other word in English. Uh, so there are different sort of mental images and connections that are being made depending on which language that you speak, which I think is pretty fascinating. Now, going on with these mixed up theme themes here, uh, the word for sausage is mixed up meat. Asuyanaha hawiya. Uh, so it's mixed up meat. And of course, salad, salad and meat and sausage have that in common that they're the different components and they're sort of blended together in a sort of a um, mixed up bunch of stuff. Um, fruit cocktail also is following the same theme through. Asuyanaha. Udatana agisti. Um, mixed up, ripe fruit. And this again, we've got the three morphemes all in one word, agisti, it to eat, which is a form we saw just a moment ago. So mixed up fruit and you eat it. It's some, something of the idea that goes into what fruit cocktail is. If you think about this phrase too much in English, you get all sorts of associations that aren't appropriate. When I was a kid, I misheard it, and I used to call it fruit cottontail, so I had the association of little bunny rabbits going down the path. But uh, if, you, if you look at the words, cocktail, uh, it makes you think of alcoholic drinks, which is, which is sort of a false association. It's just one of those weird things in the English language that this word comes into this phrase, and yet the, the total phrase doesn't seem to be the sum of its parts in English, but it certainly is in Cherokee, much more logical in a way. All right, let's look at a few more. These are just a couple of isolated examples here. 
that Linda thought were interesting. Um, there, there's this word sour, juna josti. Am I close? <laughs> you did promise to jump in if I pull a really bad one, Linda, right? All right. And this word sour figures into this phrase, which means grapefruit juice. The na, we, we saw that morphine once before, that little word, which is uh, basically corresponds to the. And then we have juna gosti, sour, and udane na hi, pardon me, which is the juice part. So the sour juice is grapefruit juice. And I, I suppose, Linda, this is sort of is, uh, you, you're sort of mentally making reference to all the other kinds of juice that might exist. There are non-sour ones, orange juice, apple juice, and so forth, or, or is it totally a phrase of its own? I think it might be just for grapefruits. No, but I mean, are there other phrases with this udane nahi for other types of juice? Okay, so, all of, so of this list of possible juices, this is the sour one. I think that's kind of how the Cherokee language is looking at it, and that certainly makes sense. Um, and then this phrase here means self-rising flower. Linda was just so fascinated by this one and thought it was so exotic. And I have suggested to her, I don't think it's so strange or really so different from the English if you really think about it. Uh, this is self-rising flower. And the, and the morpheme by morpheme translation would say, well, this first word is itself. Uh, kind of corresponds to where the word self is in English. And the next word, ajalutaska, ajalutaska something like that, means it blows up. Um, I guess in the sense of becoming bigger, not exploding. <laughs> um, or maybe it could be that. It, is, it actually is exploding. Oh, no wonder you found it funny. <laughs> and then the last word, isa, means flower. So this is, um, I guess they're saying this is the kind of flower that blows itself up. In English, we're saying this is the kind of flower that all on its own rises up. And so it's different, but to me it's not all that different. I think Lynn is probably just fascinated by this blowing up verb. I didn't realize it actually meant exploding, so I do, I do find that kind of amusing too. Anyway, so there's self-rising flower. Now we have a long example to look at this way. Um, as Linda was going through this story in the written version and analyzing it, she came across this very long and interesting phrase, which just means a medium mixing bowl, but it's very complex morphologically in Cherokee. You say, I'm sorry, that's probably pretty bad. But that's why I really wanted to have this one written down so you could see, since I probably butchered it terribly, you could see at least what the different pieces are by the placement of the translation under each word and so that you can see what each morpheme is and how it goes together. The first word means bowl, and this is both. This word means they come together, and this word means stacked. Now somehow all of this phrase, both they come together stacked, refers to the sides of the bowl, right? Did I understand you right on that, Linda? The last two words are medium. Yeah, but I mean, before, before we get to the medium part, the, the full the last two words mean full and without, and somehow together, full plus without means medium. Yes. For some reason in Cherokee, that's just how it works. But didn't you tell me that this, fr this phrase that precedes that has something to do with the sides of the bowl? Uh, it just the, this uh, explains, coming together part? Yeah, it just kind of explains that the sides of the bowl kind of, you know, come up. Huh. Yeah. Huh. So it's an extremely descriptive and complex phrase. Um, and yet it just means he's referring to a medium-sized mixing bowl, which he uses in his demonstration of the fry bread recipe. All right, now I think uh, we're running a little short on time. Let me go through some interesting but simpler examples that we wanted to talk about. Now we've had, um, in the past, we once did an entire program just on loan words in different Indian languages. Here's some interesting examples from Cherokee which show up in this discussion of food and fry bread. And I'm just going to try to pronounce these. These shouldn't be too hard for me because I know they're based on English or Spanish words, and so that gives me an extra clue as to how they probably sound. The word for oatmeal sounds something like odamili. 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 And um, commodities, which for those of you who, who may not be familiar with it, has to do with food distribution through uh, tribal uh, headquarters or uh, tribal offices. Uh, it's, it, th these are called commodities in English. So I guess it's kamalati, 
or something like that in Cherokee. And the word for coffee, there are a lot of Indian languages and a lot of languages around the world that have borrowed this word for coffee, which by the way is originally Arabic, and English borrowed it from Arabic or maybe through some other language. Um, but anyway, so this is a word that's made its way all around the world and you'll see a lot of words uh, in Oklahoma Indian languages that sound something like kawi or kapi or kape. It's something like kawi or kaw. You said they're a real fluent Cherokee speakers. Could you demonstrate how they say that again, Linda? It's cool when you say it the short way. Give it a try. Kaw. Kaw. Mm -hmm. So that means coffee. So in other words, sometimes this last syllable kind of drops off. Uh, but that's basically a borrowing of coffee. And tomato, uh, damatla. And um, Linda thought this was interesting because here tomatoes are supposed to be native to the United States, and yet the word for tomato in Cherokee, which is a North American language, seems to have been borrowed from English. How could that be? And uh, I have to, we're running out of time, so I'll have to give a real short version of this one. But I mentioned this before on the borrowing show. The word tomato is originally from the Aztec or Nahuatl language, which was spoken in Mexico, and the Spanish speakers picked it up there from the native people. In Aztec, it's tomat. In Spanish, it's tomate. And then it was imported into Europe, into Spanish and Italian and other European languages as something like tomato, tomate, things like that. And then from those languages, it was borrowed into English as tomato. And then looks like maybe the Cherokee speakers didn't have their own tomatoes, perhaps, and uh, ran into English speakers who did and called them tomatoes. And so they borrowed a word based on this English term. Um, the last example of a borrowing is this word for cow, and again, you'll see lots of borrowed terms for cow based on a Spanish word. Apparently, most tribes got their first exposure to cows and to a word for cows from Spanish speakers, and so, and this must have been the case with the Cherokees. And so, how do you pronounce the word for cow, Linda? Is it waka? 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 Uh, which is based on the Spanish word, which is spelled V-A-C-A -A and pronounced waka, but it's very close, and we, we know that that was borrowed from Spanish into Cherokee. So this is kind of a preview of some of the really fascinating things that you'll be able to hear when we do do the show, the cooking demonstration and the uh, family meals and fry bread story. Uh, I think that's about all we have time for now. So um, you can look forward to seeing the real thing when we actually do the fry bread show at a later date, hopefully pretty soon. Thank you for joining us tonight. And I'll see you next time on WordPath. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma gona kita, wa pene ma da oni kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma gona kita, wa pene ma da oni kita. Na hene yo hene, na hene yo hene, ana ma gona kita, wa pene ma da oni kita. Na hene yo hene